uh, the hello everyone. Uh, that this is uh, the Asia Pacific Research Platform, the Working Group Session One. So uh, I'm Jung Hoon Moon uh, from KISTI in Korea. The KISTI is uh, the Korea the representative of the Super Computing Center and the Research Network Center. The miking is the a little bit the howling. It's for least reduce the volume and. Uh, our the first session is uh, uh the before that I the want to the the very shortly introduce about this APRP working group. Uh, APRP working group is an initiative at the AFAN the forty five meeting in the Singapore. At that time, and so we made uh the the of a fees, and then this we are gonna be to the uh working group, the formerly working group in APAN. So the totally the name is the Asia Possible Research Platform. The research platform is comes from uh, UC San Diego and the ESNet, and, and it comes from the US. Uh, they have. Uh, is it okay to the the howling? Is a howling. Yeah, the sound is a howling. That's okay. Okay, and. Uh, Yes, uh, the, it's the basically the technology based on the science team technology. It means that is a uh, uh, the very ultra high speed the big data superway and the combined the, the distributed the, the computing source, uh, the the using the Kubernetes. Uh, the Kubernetes is the well known this middleware to the gather the computer resources to make one things as a path and to so provide to the application users. So the, our the applic uh, our working group the object is the uh, is the shell of XRP. X meaning is the ARP, the NRP, PRP, or the X is the can be the anything. And the Korea in case of Korea KRP, Australia is ARP, New Zealand is uh, it just assumed that uh, NGRP, yes, something like that. So uh, we wanted to promote the HPC ecosystem in the ASEA Pacific regions and engage APAN members and the ASEAN countries, and then toward the, the setting of an ASEA Pacific research platform and become a part of the global research platform. The global research platform is the, the totally wanted to make this one thing for globally. So uh, it, it's kind of the consortium and the, the every the uh, the XRP the uh, the readers and the engineers as members is uh, come join to the GRP workshop and share their experience and how to promote is in the future the local areas. Our target is is academia and the industry. Uh, executive member is chair and the co chair and we have the secretaries. And then the particular thing is is we. Uh, the get funded from this uh, ten office uh, the last one year. The building a high bandwidth the distributed HPC. Uh, I will explain about uh, this five minutes later. So and uh, we are the last uh, six years. We are the twelve times for the six year held working group meeting and uh, twenty four sessions in the several countries and the several presentations. So. Uh, I will shortly introduce about this, uh, the session one that we have the eight presenters. Uh, some of the presenters is from remote, is some of the in presence in here. The second uh, uh, session is uh, the chair is Andrew Howard from the NCI in Australia. And uh, the second uh, session is, uh, has the six presenters from the uh, remote and on site. So uh, I want to give a talk to the my the first uh, uh, program is the Asia Connector project building a high bandwidth to distribute to the HPC. The, actually this uh, the presentation is the last uh, the, on Monday and is uh, uh, I, I I I presented the uh, the 10, 10 Asia Connector meetings and the, for deeply. Uh, I just uh, the briefly introduce about all of these uh, the uh, overview and the review and very shortly in this time. So uh, as I mentioned before, this is, uh, uh, the APRP working group is uh, the funded from this uh, 10 office. Uh, the name is Asia Connector Project and the, the title is the Building a High Bandwidth Distributed HPC. 
And the project overview is the just one year and the, the budget is 150k euro. And our the participant countries is Malaysia, Korea, Pakistan, and Australia. The the participant countries role is uh, Australia and the Korea is uh, donated our the experience and uh, donated some technical issues, and the Pakistan and uh, Malaysia donated their the local science application in case of Pakistan is AI science, and uh, in case of Malaysia, uh, they the, uh, apply for the uh, bioscience. They have a lot of the bioinformatics scientists and the areas. In case of Pakistan, they have a lot of the students and the members for the AI areas. And then this is uh, our the project background. Uh, we can find out is uh, the left picture is uh, the PRP project. It comes from a Pacific research platform in UC San Diego in US. Uh, they the first uh, the make the the uh, the thick the white line is the big data superhighway the, on the the California the research network and the, the the blue spot is the science DMG based uh, DTN node and the research platform is uh, uh, combines uh, uh, this infrastructure and made by this Kubernetes and the Kubernetes is uh, the managing this uh, distributed the CPU, GPU, and the memory intensive, uh, such like a uh, servers, and uh, gather the one, make the one resource part to give this provide to what they want to use. So at that case is the very uh, the remarkable the result to uh, the some the uh, the CO two the researchers uh, how uh, is depends on this uh, climate change, and they are using a distributed a form for. Uh, the locally distributed four servers uh, and to make one resource part and the running their jobs and the, the result is remarkable. And then left side is in case of Korea, the, um, the apply for this LSTM, the uh, AI, the editable, the, uh, the algorithms to deploy in the 24, the Korean, uh, the government funded the research institute. Uh, those result is the very insight for and inspirations for the Korea domestic science areas. So uh, the PRP is uh, uh, the upgrade is NRP. The NRP is uh, uh, the going to the GRP. GRP is uh, versus APRP. The APRP is to get the fund from the Asia Connect project. Yes, the, the global trend is, as you mentioned, is uh, the data is increased remarkably. And uh, the, for especially the ASEAN areas uh, has uh, uh, a lot of the smart brain, but we don't have enough uh, computing resources to implement our thought and our research. Uh, this project is the main goal is to, to provide research platform distributed to uh, to make this, uh, the ASEAN areas is the upgrade about this, uh, several the research areas. So the this is the whole picture of this our project. A band with a distributed HPC and uh, the advanced countries is donated some servers and the experience of technology and the, the beneficiary countries is the, the running or the implement their thought and their research and their code and something like that. So in case of the two, we are two cases. So the, we are the three steps. The activity one is building a big data superhighway based on TAIN or the NNs. In the for globally, and the second activity is building a distributed HPC platform based on the Kubernetes. The Kubernetes is a game changer to make the distributed environment, as you know, is very powerful and very dominant uh, technology. And the third thing is we are deployed is the uh, pilot user case AI and the bioinformatics. This is uh, the briefly the uh, the picture of the, the building of the big data superhighway based on TAIN. Uh, it is a, a very important, uh, but it's uh, the most, uh, the harder things because the every the end point is the uh, network configuration is uh, not easy to the, is what we want. So we have this continuous the negotiation and the discussion with the local network operation center and the local the network engineers. And we want to make this the fully the high speed end to end 
uh, the network environment. This is our the, uh, the achievement through the so one year our project. And then as we uh, set up the DTN and make the fast guarantee and uh, the set up this, uh, the persona, this is the network measurement system and how to uh, the set up this manually. And this is activity two is building a distributed HPC platform. Uh, we uh, distribute is a KIST, NCI, and uh, Circle IV University, Ferradana University. And uh, finally, we want is a part of this GRP or PRP. So we are the, uh, the building and the construction is the right side is the, the platform architecture inside. The left side is uh, the what kind of the, the open source of what we used. And at the bottom of the table is the hardware specifications. And this is our the uh, the activity. Activity is uh, the last one year, and the workshop MOU and the set of the master node and the tutorial and the make the, some the conference. And then this is the the user management technology based on this uh, blockchain technology, but it's just a prototype. The research the currently the is a user management is the uh, the ID federation technology. And then this is the very simple uh, user uh, the interface. So we wanted to make this web portal, but it takes a uh, long time. But just one year, and we make this very easy, the access point uh, as uh, the, uh, the web uh, the model. And this is uh, the <clears throat> activity three, is the um, AI science and the bioscience. In case of the, the rep side is the AI case, AI science case from Pakistan. The rep side is the bioinformatics is the, the Malaysia case. Uh, they the currently they're running their jobs on our the research platform and they made uh, the, some uh, the, the efficient result. And this is in case of the running the uh, distributed platform, they're using one or two CPU and then using uh, two GPU machines. And there's a GPU machine, so it's a better, much better the result. <laughs> I'm sorry. And this is the uh, the, the other achievement. Uh, the, what I mentioned before, there is uh, some conference and uh, make the video clip and the technical report and the publication international journal and something like that. Just for one year. So our new challenge is the, uh, the Korea domestic, in case of the Korea domestic status, uh, the related the three, uh, the project is the, the ongoing, the underlines. Uh, the first thing is the smart hospital development project. The so title is uh, uh, some, the, the medical issues. The our, the contribution point is a big data supervisor for inter-hospital for human and the genome data centers. The second thing is a career rural development of the administration the project. The title is integrated linkage system for the agriculture, big data, and the utilization model. The, our contribution point is to uh, the running the crumb models uh, system uh, or the re research platform donated and building and support for the um, End user. So we uh they have the two types of end user. The one type of end user is just the farmer. Just the farmer is uh, uh the using our the uh, the result of the uh, this crumb model, and uh, the the other the user is a uh, uh, agriculture researcher. They learning their own their model on this platform. And the third thing is a career environment institute project is granted. Uh, uh, the last December, and the name is the, the establishment an integrated impact assessment platform and the building of the ensemble of the multi-climate scenario based on the new climate resign. Very complicated, but our, our the contribution point is building a container-based research platform and the SEP storage. They want to do the several the models is make the ensemble using the AI or something like that. So we want to uh, we can uh, develop uh, or the, the construction or set up this, uh, the research platform the, based on the container technology. It means that it's a Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, the store, the share, and the sending the big data, the using SEP storage. And this, uh, uh, the last slide is the future plans. Is, uh, all of uh, this content is the, the result of the, our the, 
uh, Asia Connect project, we want to continuously deploy this technology and expand the local point in Asia areas through the APRP working group. So uh, the, our beginning step is the, just the collaboration is Australia, Malaysia, Pakistan, and we want to expand the neighbor countries. Um, and all of our the using, uh, the, uh, the managing and the operating, and the, we will do it the, through the, the ASEA, the Pacific research platform, the working group. And the extension for third parties research areas is uh, just, uh, I assume there's three areas. The first one is smart agriculture. The agriculture problem is a big issue is, uh, everywhere. So we want to run the crop model or the climate change model or the combining and ensemble model running as a smart agriculture on this platform. And the environmental research on the climate change is a, is a pure and the climate change research area. The third thing is uh, the cloud computing and the wireless communication areas is kind of the based on the uh, IT areas. The cloud technology is the core technology and the wireless communication is uh, we know the, the 5G and the 6G environment is the almost overcome this uh, wired networks. So the wireless technology is very important to the, uh, is, uh, the long distance and uh, uh, the isolation areas. But uh, so far, I tried to the, is, uh, the explain about our the one year the uh, Asia Connect project, and uh, mm, it is over the the five minutes. Uh, I want to show the the next presenter, and uh, if you have the, any the question or uh, about this project and to me, and uh, uh, please is uh, asking the break time. Okay, thank you for your listening. And uh, I will introduce is the next uh, uh, presenter is uh, uh, Kihyun Kim and uh, from KIST in Korea. He is one of my the great partners to develop my, the, the core uh, architecture of a research platform. Okay, Kihyun Kim, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, so please go ahead yeah, with the presentation. Uh, can you hear my voice? Okay, this is where. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kian Kim. I work at KIST. Uh, I'm charge of development platform in uh, Asia Connect uh, project. Uh, today, I will explain. Uh, wait. Ah, uh, okay. Today, I will explain uh, platform development in Asia Connect project. Uh, I will explain about the APIP infrastructure status. Uh, this figure is for the establishment of Science DMG in Asia Connect project. This project uh, establishes Science DMG in Korea, Australia, Pakistan, and Malaysia, and connect connect uh, distributed DTNs in Asia to es establish Science DMG. After that. The APIP platform is developed using the DTM built in each country. Uh, based on that infrastructure, we want to develop an AI research platform for use by researchers in various fields in Asia. Uh, this figure is a... Uh, uh, this figure is a configuration diagram of equipment uh, construction in four countries. Uh, as shown in the picture above, four servers and one switch were completed in Malaysia. Uh, and the picture shown above is a picture taken after uh, actual construction. So we configure three worker node and one master node and one SAP storage node. Uh, the GPU consists of six and the CPU is about 180 cores. Um, the storage size is composed of about 55 terabyte. Uh, and uh, Australia donated one DTN server and Pakistan will donate one DTN server. And Korea donated one storage server 
uh, and SAP storage is built and connected with Malaysia master node. Uh, I will explain about how to develop APRP. Uh, most of the uh, API platform was built using, using open source. Uh, open source platforms were installed for platform management and orchestrator was developed so that users can use them more easily. Uh, as open source is used to uh, manage the platform, Kubernetes, which creates and manages manages the most important containers of the platform. Uh, and the SAP storage are used for storage and the harbor is used as a private image registry. Uh, and uh, system monitoring uses uh, Prometheus and Grafana and the server logs and errors use Elasticsearch and Kibana. Open source is used by users to uh, perform AI tasks or programming using R, MPI, PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, Python, uh, and so on. Uh, shown above the interface basically provided by the platform uh, is configured to utilize Jupyter Notebook. Uh, for all images, Jupyter Notebook becomes the base image. It also provides a, a command line interface. Uh, the reason why a Jupyter Notebook is used as a base image is that the environment, the environment that links the authorization system will be linked to Jupyter Notebook in the future. Uh, the uh, structure of the AI research environment providing platform is as follows. The most important role among each component is by far the Kubernetes cluster module. And through this module, all functions are developed to operate on a container basis. Uh, from the user's point of view in this uh, structure, it consists of login, computing, transfer, uh, storage, and monitoring. The transfer part is transmitted using DTN, and the login is configured to login through the uh, key clock. And I will explain in more detail about the computing and storage monitoring part. Uh, first, Let's talk about the computing module. The computing module is the uh, uh, the computing module uh, is uh, uh, com uh, describe a computing environment and a distributed computing environment. Uh, the individual computing environment is configured so that individual users are allocated the computing resources. They want to create a uh, create a container, and the created container image is created based on Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is an open source web application uh, that allows you to create and share documents, including live code, uh, visualization, and so on. Uh, when user create a container, a web URL is automatically created, and if they enter through the URL, uh, they enter the Jupyter Notebook UI as shown in the uh, figure below. Uh, the AI coding interface that can be used inside provides various interfaces such as Python, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, and MPI. Uh, Qflow is a fr free and open source machine learning platform designed to enable, enable, uh, enable using machine learning pipelines to orchestrate complicated workflows uh, running on Kubernetes. Uh, Qflow provides various uh, frameworks for constructing researchers' machine learning models. The purpose of Qflow uh, in this module is for distributed computing. Uh, distributed computing environment provides massive computing using all GPUs in worker node. 
uh, to use uh, cube, cube flows distributed computing, you need a, a parental server and a worker server. Uh, and next, in order to perform the compute model, we need a system for sorting images. Hover is a tool for private image registries. In our system, it is used to provide images in private and public environment. Uh, in the case of private images, users store the image they create in Hover and the provided system provides an environment where users can share them according to the user's permission. The storage module consists of SAP and RU. Uh, SAP storage is an open source software defined storage platform that make it easy to manage sto uh, storage servers with software. It provides object storage, block storage, and file system interface, and uh, and uh, the the size of the current provided storage server is about fifty five terabyte, and when configuring the storage, it is configured as object storage. Object storage enables data transfer with other users, and when object storage is configured, it is currently configured to link with other cloud platform to transfer the data I used to the cloud platform. Uh, next is the monitoring module. The monitoring module used Prometheus and Grafana. So uh, this part, this is the graph configured in the currently configured monitoring system. Uh, I will explain about APIP currently status. Uh, this is the currently uh, login screen of the API platform. Uh, all of the login related part is done and the user will log, log into the platform. Uh, if you access the platform after logging Hello. in, you can see the- Hello, can you see? Yeah. 예, 여기 네트워크 문제가 좀 생겨서 조금 기다려야 될것 같아요. 잠시만 아, 좀 대기 전에 카톡으로 보낼게요. 저 근데 빨리 돌아가 봐야 되는데. 예, 잠시만 기다려 주세요. 지금 거의 몇장 남았어요? 저 이제 거의 마지막입니다. 아, 그러면 지금 약간 앞으로 가 볼래요. 조금 더 하나 더 하나 더. 뭐 하나 더 하나 더. 하나 더. 어, 그 다음. 그 다음 페이지, 다음 페이지. 다음 페이지. 다음 페이지. 요게 셉 스토리지구나. 요거 다음이 뭐예요? 아, 요거 다음. 아, 그 앞, 앞에 셉 스토리지 토폴로지부터 해야 될것 같은데 아, 여기도 시간이 만만치 않은데 일단 요거 전에 전에 페이지부터 하고 예, 요, 여기서부터 해야 될것 같은데 잠시만 기다려주세요 이거 호텔 네트워크에 한번 죽었거든 제가 카톡으로 바로 알려줄게요 네 
예. 아, 기현 씨, 지금 예. 시작해 주면 될것 같아요. 네. 예. 예. 네. 아. 아. <웃음> uh, I will I will restart. Yeah, the uh, storage module consists of SEP and loop. SEP storage is an open source software defined storage platform that make it easy to manage storage servers with software. Uh, it provides object storage, block storage, and the file system interface. Uh, and the size of the currently provided uh, storage server is about 55 terabyte. Yeah, and uh, we used the, the uh, platform uh, use uh, uh, object storage interface. Yeah, and the next uh, monitoring system uh, monitoring system module. Yeah, uh, this is the uh, graph configured in the currently configured monitoring system. And then I will explain about the APRP currently status. Uh, this is the current login screen of the API platform. Uh, all, the, all of the login related parts are done and the users will log into the platform. Uh, if you access the platform after login, uh, you can see the following UI. The menu is divided into four categories and consists of dashboard, container management, uh, storage management, and node, node management. Yeah, uh, and then the current state of APRP is not complete, uh, completely uh, complete. Uh, the UI part needs a, a version update to the previous version. Also, uh, when calling APIs for storage and container create, uh, get works normally, but post does, does not work normal, normally. Uh, we are continuously work, working to uh, resolve the issue and uh, it requires a little so, uh, source code change, but it is uh, solving the problem of being created beyond the, the limit of the GPU. Uh, when the API platform is completed, uh, we plan to uh, deliver guidelines on how to use it uh, from the system administrator's side and from user side. And when we did the user test in the last uh, tutorial, uh, we saw that users needed a, a detailed guide on storage. Contain container storage has a separate folder uh, for the uh, for object storage, and it is uh, thought that uh, there is a need for guidelines to storage data, uh, store data in that folder. Yeah. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you. And Kian, thank you for your presentation. And we don't have much time to the, the communicate the, the Q&A. And uh, we're gonna okay, okay. Uh, start this next presenter. Thank you, Guillaume. And uh, can Thank you me. hear me, Asi Plaza? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, and uh, please go ahead. And he is uh, uh, the one of our uh, uh, the Asia Connect project partner is the uh, the from the Pakistan. He introduces the AI science and the related work. It's wow. kind of the distributed kind of the HPC environment. Asi, go ahead. Yeah, Moon, can you please share the screen? I cannot share the screen right now. Can you allow me? Wait a minute. Uh, the, his material is not on the screen. I'm not allowed to share my screen. Uh, he cannot allow the permit to, to share their screen. Asip Laja. Okay, to share your material. Okay, can you see? Okay, you can see. Ah, okay, hello everyone. Uh, 
My name is Asif and I am the co-PI of this, you know, the project, Asia Connect project. And I was working with the Moon and uh, Andrew and Keon Kim and Ashila and all these guys on this project. Uh, before that, I was part of the Sakraibi University as assistant professor. And currently I am working at Fermi Lab as a network R&D professional. And recently I joined here, uh, you know, at Fermi Lab in US. So I'm going to present uh, about the AI science use cases uh, that we deployed, uh, you know, by using the distributed HPC platform at Sakraibia University. So these are the contents that are, I'm going to give you the overview of the distributed HPC platform, which already given by the moon, but I'm going very quickly. And then a uh, roadmap of Sakraibi University for AI science, AI use cases, and the future use cases and expansion plan for the HPC. And finally, the Q&A session. So uh, if we talk about the distributed HPC platform, this was you know, already presented by the moon that this is the uh, plan that we had before that we are you know, trying to build the, this uh, distributed HPC platform among these four countries. So we have to build high speed network connectivity among these countries. We have you know, the computing resources, we have the storage resources. And by utilizing all those resources at the countries like the Pakistan and Malaysia, we are running some workloads, we are running some use cases over this platform. And these were the four, three activities that we planned, uh, which I already discussed by the moon. I'm not going into the detail, but as far as my part, uh, I was engaged in all those activities, uh, but mainly I was engaged in, you know, the presenting the pilot use cases on, by using this platform. So this was the, uh, in the first activity, we built the, you know, the, uh, path and we connected all the sites, uh, you know, as you can see by using the TN network. And after connecting the all the sites, uh, then we, you know, installed the DTNs, uh, which I already mentioned. But the main thing here is I want like to mention that we also, you know, separated all the DTNs, all the, you know, DTNs at the uh, sites in countries uh, by using the science DMZ architecture. I think if you are familiar with our science DMZ architecture, that it's separating, you know, the scientific networks and the, your campus networks, right? So we also followed some security policy. We did some, you know, uh, TCP tuning on all those DTNs. Uh, and we also had configured, you know, the monitoring system by using the perf sonar. We tested all the sites, they were working perfectly. Now, this was all, you know, related to all first two activities. Now let's uh, jump into the, our third activity where we utilize the distributed HPC platform for, you know, AI use cases. So before going into that, I would like to discuss about the roadmap of Sakraibia University for AI science means I was, where I was working before. So, and if we, if we talk about, you know, the AI science, AI research at Sakraibi University, we are basically promoting the research of AI by using, you know, the, our uh, departmental department of the computer science. Uh, we have, you know, number of courses that we are, you know, offering for students like uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning, and so on and so forth. Uh, the second thing that we have within the computer science department, we have a CREP center, which is called the Center of you know, Excellence for Robotics, AI, and Blockchain. So that uh, center is dedicatedly working on the AI research at Sakaraibi University. And it has you know, some facilities and infrastructure, but not too much. So therefore, we utilize this platform, distributed HPC platform. What is basically the purpose of this CREP center is to promote the AI research in, you know, uh, various ways like we are conducting the trainings of AI, machine learning and deep learning. We are conducting some workshops, we are conducting some seminars and our students are utilizing, you know, the resources to uh, do some AI research. Hey, this, this is basically, you can see, this is our CREP center and these are some workshops and, you know, seminars for students in AI and, you know, robotics. So these are, uh, we are also working on, you know, some distributed deep learning frameworks, our students, our researchers, our faculty members who are working on in AI research, 
they are you know also working on some distributed deep learning frameworks like the pytorch the distributed tensorflow and horowood all these you know the ai related distributed workflows so uh, currently if we talk about our resources uh, our you know challenges uh, and our future requirements uh, at our uh, sakribia university obviously uh, it will be uh, we have the shortage of the resources the biggest challenge i can say that we have the shortage of resources uh, to run to execute to test the large scale workflows uh, at our you know for uh, at our center at our crab center in sakribia university so what uh, we have the plan that we ha we should have a dedicated you know uh, hpc environment there we can you know do the r and d so currently because of the limitation of resources we cannot do you know high performance computing and ai related research in our center therefore we are going to utilize this platform and uh, which is called the uh, distributed HPC, hpc platform and we are utilizing this platform for ai research and education purpose so what research we are doing we are doing some advanced ai and machine learning research we implemented some algorithms over there advanced machine learning and deep learning algorithms on this platform we also you know have opportunity to utilize this platform for teaching courses i mean suppose that uh, we are we having some sort of lab works uh, for students that can perform uh, by using this you know platform and we also can conduct some ai machine learning and deep learning workshop and seminars by using this platform so these this is how we can utilize this platform and we already did uh, i'll show you that what use cases we perform on you know this distributed hpc platform and this is the first use case where we train the machine learning model using the svm uh, we use uh, the platform GUI and we, you know, use the Jupyter Notebook and we, you know, code it. And these are some results. I'm going very quickly because uh, shortage of time. So uh, we also not only, you know, the trained the model, we also deployed the model. You know, we use the fast um, APIs to develop uh, and deploy the model that we already trained and we verify that model. This is basically the model of, you know, uh some sort of diagnosing the disease uh blood sugar uh, you know and this is the model related to that the other thing that we tested and we you know in, in this platform is the distributed deep learning as i told that our researchers are also working on the distributed deep learning so we demonstrated also uh, how the distributed tensorflow framework can you know use on this platform uh, so these are some results that you can see in the third use case that we have we also you know work with distributed mpi workloads also not only the tensorflow we also uh, you know run the mpi related workloads and the fourth is uh, basically the uh, as i told that we are also teaching the, uh, you utilizing this platform for teaching purposes so we created some labs where a student can perform the labs by using these this platform so this is how we, you know, we utilize the platform. And these are some more projects that we are going to implement and we are going to test in future and near future. This is the aspects and an emotion recognition from the audio in Urdu language. And then this is the complete, you know, uh, architecture of our model. And this is uh, the Pakistan vehicle classification using deep learning approaches. The, another project we are going to test by using this platform, uh, and offline handwritten text and convert the text handwritten text into the you know to fill the forms automatically and this is uh, multi object tracking for vehicle air uh, for vehicles right so identify the vehicle speed identify the vehicle numbers which lane it is going so all those things we are you know going to test by using this platform uh, this cbrc hpc platform so now the and this is how we tested the platform by using the ai use cases by utilizing the ai you know uh, research uh, from the sakribia university now as far as you know the future use cases concerned i have some suggestions for this platform that how we can expand this platform uh, distributed hpc platform uh, currently uh, we have the ai and the bioinformatics use cases so how we can expand this platform, we can expand this platform for more scientific research and education purposes, right? 
how we can you know uh, implement some scientific workload test beds such as the cms experiment uh, we are currently here we have some test beds here uh, at usa in fermi lab and other sites also so we can research on you know the cms workloads and utilize the computing resources of the platform the cbd spc platform uh, and and then we can, you know, also perform some large scale data transfer of the CMS experiment uh, by using the high speed networks and not only the just utilize the high speed network, but efficiently utilize the high speed network by using the sense network orchestration solution. So we can, you know, uh, dig into more, you know, uh, that how we can expand this distributed HPC platform not only within the Asia outside of the Asia as well. So I have this plan. Uh, we can talk with the Moon as well in future. So this is the sense architecture which I am talking about. Not only you know we are using the high speed network, but efficiently use the high speed network by using this sense solution. Sense is basically the SDN enabled network for science at exact scale. So we can automate you know orchestrate the network end to end network among you know, the sites among the countries, whenever we need to transfer the data, we have dedicated point to point, end to end, you know, uh, you know, path from site A to site B to transfer the data to, you know, do some CMS related experiment and work on the, you know, data transfer related things. So this is the current experiment test bed we have in US uh, using the Sense Rusio FTS uh, interoperation system deployment where UCSD, Caltech, University of Nebraska, Fermi Lab, and also we have some sort of the sun part as well through which we are, you know, utilizing. Um, by the way, that UCSD, UCSD is deployed the uh, PRP project over there and we are using that, you know, similar type of project that we are, you know, from, uh, we are using here at, in APRP. So same type of project we have at UCSD and we are utilizing for CMS experiment and we deploy the sense, uh, you know, architecture over there. So this is how we, we can, you know, expand our future, uh, you know, the distributed HPC platform, not only in Asia, we can expand it, it, it to the US as well. So if you, if, you know, the Korea and Kisti wants, Moon wants and other, you know, uh, having the opportunity of this thing. So that's all from my side. I hope uh, I explain some sort of, you know, the AI use cases on this platform. Uh, if you have any question, you can, you're welcome. You can ask it anytime now. Yeah, or thank later. you. Asipo, yeah, Asipo Raja, thank you. He comes from the Chicago. <laughs> he currently the working for the, the Fedemi lab in Chicago. So, uh, Asipo, we don't have any other time, then we have to skip this Q&A session and okay. every day question is through email. Thank you for your attending and the presenting. You. And the next speaker is Asipo Han from Perdana University. He's one of a great our the project partner. He working for the bioinformatics areas. He, uh, Asipo Han, are you ready? Asipo? Uh, Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, all right, let me... He permitted to share his presentation. Already done? Okay. Please share your uh, the material. Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay. All right. Can you see the screen? Okay, we can see. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. I'm sorry for all this. Uh, I can give you this for ten minutes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm thank sorry. you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Moon, uh, for the invitation to present, um, and and thank you for the to the audience, uh, you know, for for joining our session. Now I'm gonna be fast, this is only 10 minutes. Uh, this is gonna be a little different. I'm you know, gonna present or shake a showcase to you from a user point of view. And you know, uh, and I'm gonna be a user from the life sciences. So someone from the life sciences to demonstrate to you how the platform that was explained by Asif Raza and you know, built by Jung Hoon and other team members, how it's very crucial and important for the work that we do in biology, All right? So, So this might be a little different. 
uh, you know, so very quickly, an overview, we all know viruses are very important and we are just coming out of COVID and there's a now a new variant. So I'm not sure we are fully out of COVID, but um, but we, we all know the importance of studying viruses. So this work, this demonstration that I'm going to give you is for the study of viruses. Now, if you know, there are many lethal viruses. These are just some of the names of those lethal viruses. And we just went through SARS. Uh, so COVID was, um, you know, caused by SARS. So we are very familiar with SARS. There are some others that uh, also come and go. Um, now, because of the importance of these viruses, there's a lot of study that's going on. And one of the key areas of study is the sequence data, right? We want to sequence the genome of these viruses and because that's the blueprint. And once we have these blueprints, we can study them, understand them, and come up with ways like drugs, vaccines, diagnostics to overcome these uh, pathogens, these viruses, when, when there is an outbreak. All right, so this is just, just to showcase to you that the data is growing rapidly. Uh, in fact, this is not the latest plot. The latest plot, like for SARS, it was just a tremendous growth. In fact, what we collected in two years kind of you know surpassed what we had collected over the last 42 years. All right, so, uh, so the, the amount of data growth is just amazing. All right, um, and there are many data sources. So like this is not put the, the, the data is not put in some place that's locked and nobody has access to it. The data is publicly available. It's free. You and I can, you know, even use our phone and just access these data. All right. So this is a, just an example of a browser. NCBI is a very famous portal. You can go there. Uh, you can go to taxonomy browser. You can search for SARS. You can search for all viruses and you will get the data. So this is uh, you know, all viruses a few years ago. So this is not the latest picture, 6 million. Now we have like 50 plus million. And this is SARS, you know, 55,000. And now I think um, we probably have 30, 40 million of uh, SARS sequences, right? So so there are there are data sources. And what's nice about these data sources is you, do, you can actually navigate through the lineage. You can go at a species level, you can go at a family level, at a genus level, or all viruses. So if you want to know all viruses, you click there, you get the whole data, right? So we, when we have... So, and there are a few other sources. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Um, and so there's a lot of data. Now, our viruses compared to bacteria and all that, viruses actually mutate, change faster. So that becomes another reason why we want to study, uh, you know, pay atten more attention to these viruses because they change and we can learn something about these mutations. And that's why this new variant of COVID that has been reported uh, is as a result of these changes that happen more rapidly in viruses compared to bacteria. Now, there are three types of, uh, you know, changes. Uh, we have something called um, uh, genetic diversity. This is the D DNA and, and, you know, the DNA can change, but not all changes at the DNA change at the protein level. Some changes do not change the amino acid or the protein. Some do change the amino acids. And then not all amino acid changes actually change the uh, immune recognition. So you might have a change in amino acid, but it doesn't change the recognition by the immune system. The immune system can still recognize, but there are some that if they change, it will change the recognition by the immune system. So there is complexity. It's not simple, straightforward, get the data, look at the changes, and that's it. All right. So this complicates the situation. And it's these antigenic changes that result in immune escape. You know, these new variants, they escape recognition from the immune system. We have something called original antigenic sin, where you get infected, you become immune, but when the next infection happens, actually it becomes worse. Like dengue one infects you, you are immune now after, you know, recovering. But when dengue two comes, actually it becomes worse uh, because your immune system thinks it's dengue one and cause the memory cells, the soldiers for dengue one, but this is actually dengue two different. So it gets confused. So there's a little bit of a problem there and it becomes worse because the immune system attacks the body. And then, of course, uh, all this diversity, it's a challenge in vaccine design and drug design and diagnostic design, uh, but more particularly for uh, vaccine design. All right. Um, and then, you know, just want to show that why um, one, even one change, let's say position nine, W changes to D something, all right? Why that change is kind of punctuated. Just one change can be a huge impact because uh, the immune system, it recognizes small parts of these sequences. So for example, it could recognize one to nine, two to 10, three to 11, four to 12, et cetera. We do not know which part it recognizes, but it recognizes parts. It doesn't recognize the whole, you know, long sequence. So depending on which part, 
it could, let's say it recognizes all these parts. So you can potentially impact up to like, you know, nine epi, uh, nine potential T cell epitopes. Epitopes are, or these are, epitope is the word, to rec, you know, something recognized by the immune system. So it can impact up to nine epitopes, all right? Um, so, so we need to study them, study all these sequences. And there are two different approaches, alignment dependent and alignment independent. Alignment dependent, you take these sequences, you align them very nicely and you look for those differences, you color code them. So uh, this may, it makes it very easy to find and study that. However, when you have all, uh, when you have a, a virus that's very, very diverse, sometimes alignment becomes a problem. But that's not the only thing. If you want to study all viruses, you cannot align them because they're all very different. You cannot take HIV and align them with flu because they are not the same, right? So when you take all viruses, alignment, it becomes impossible. So when you have impossible alignment, how do you study all these changes? Then you need something called alignment independent approach. Now, Here's an example of an alignment independent approach and um, where we actually um, try to you know, find something called minimal set or, or study the diversity in a different way by reducing the diversity. So for example, we have uh, three sequences that are very different because um, here you have L, F, F, and here you have Q, L, Q. So overall, these are three different sequences. And if, what we do is we break down, we create this, uh, this uh, what do you call this, uh, Kmers uh, of each of these sequences. So we generate the Kmers and then we compare the Kmers and we notice all the Kmers here are the same and all the Kmers here are the same. This means, and all the Kmers here are the same. This means actually the middle sequence is useless, it's redundant. We don't really need it because the information is already captured by the first sequence and the third sequence. So this is called minimal set. We can actually study the data, get rid of sequences that we don't even need to study and reduce the set data set to a minimal set. That's where we then look for vaccine design and all that. So that's an example of um, an alignment dependent way to study uh, diversity. It's a bit different from the alignment dependent. This is independent alignment free. And, and so we, we use these approaches. Um, and, and then we actually uh, you know, created an algorithm to, to, get all, to take all the sequences, do this, and then come up with the minimal set. And then we can then study the minimal set. And then, um, so we built a tool called Unique Min uh, that is able to do this. And here we demonstrate um, that, you know, uh, from uh, this is 4 million sequences. We remove duplicates because there are many duplicates. We get about uh, 2 million sequences, so huge reduction. So the databases have a lot of duplicates also. And then from the duplicates, we were able to reduce it further, like 1.3 million, almost like a 1 million um, um, you know, sequences um, were, were lost. Uh, this, this percentage is from the total data, so it's much less. But from here, you can see we managed to reduce it further. So uh, this is an example of an alignment in a free method to reduce the data so that uh, analysis can be done. Now, the challenges, and, and here's the tool, but the key is that, you know, we struggled a lot with this. In order to, to make this tool happen, we actually had to spend like seven months just for this whole work to be done uh, on, on, a, on a standard computing platform that we had. We needed supercomputing platform, something like, you know, that um, Asif Raza and Jamhur has described to be able to reduce this to uh, actually 18 days. And recently we managed to optimize this further and reduce it to, uh, if I'm not wrong, like uh, two days. So that's a huge improvement. And this has happened thanks to the platform, the technology, this distributed platform that's available, um, you know, now through this pro collaborative project. So, uh, so that's it, um, you know, just to, you know, demonstrate how uh, seven months of work became two months and uh, sorry, 18 days. And from 18 days, it became just two days. Uh, and, and the importance of computing. And now this enables us to ask more questions, deeper questions and take you know, the tool further and do all kinds of different interesting analysis. And the work has been published. Um, and that's, I just wanna acknowledge the student, Lee Chuin Chong, uh, who was actually um, uh, critical uh, to move this project forward and the funding agencies and other collaborators. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Jung Hoon. I hope I didn't exceed the time. Thank you, Asif Han. And he, I think his state is Egypt. So are you right? Uh, no, Qatar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. the great presentation. Thank you. And we want to skip this Q&A session. And okay. the next uh, the presenter is uh, the Vincenzo Capone from Jiang in EU. And the please, um, please let us see. I think it's already.
Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is uh, Enzo Capone and I work for Giant. Um, what I'd like to talk about is the um, LHC1 uh, multi-domain service, which I think it's quite uh, an interesting case of a, a large scale global platform that can, uh, infrastructure, sorry, that can underpin data distribution uh, platform for um, high performance data. Uh, just a little bit of history. So where is this idea coming from? It came from the design of the data model for LHC experiments. Um, the original model, this is quite an old picture, uh, was a, a hierarchical model. So that you had CERN as the so-called team zero, and you had the number of distribution sites around the world called tier one, like and then word for the physicists to do their analysis. Uh, so which uh, uh, this structure, so a very hierarchical structure. So uh, pretty simple in, in, to, to a certain extent. And in fact, the first device by the international NREN community was what is called the LHC optical private network. So basically a dedicated set of links uh, um, star um, with, the, with the star shape where CERN was in the middle and uh, a few dedicated links around the world to connect the majority of these uh, large sites. You can see here what was basically the very first um, uh, version of this uh, uh, network service. Then reality happens. So basically what happened was that while the design for the LHC OPN was based on this little amount of data at the bottom, the vast majority of the data that was produced afterwards by the user analysis was overwhelmingly higher than the expected design. So this basically caused uh, a change in the model, which made from uh, uh, you know a, a very hierarchical model to so basically an anarchy model because the uh, pre defined path for data distribution were not allowed to allow this very large scale of data anymore. So basically, the, the, the hierarchical model could get, get lost. That's where this new idea came from. So a different kind of network infrastructure to allow for this uh, large scale data distribution. And this was the first uh, logical model of the future LHC1 uh, network. So basically having a distributed, a distributed global large scale infrastructure that could allow a flexible connectivity of sites with, with different kind of um, topology. This was the first step. So the first step was the idea of setting up a multi-point to multi-point um, LAN, basically, uh, so based on layer two circuits. Um, well, it turns out that LAN and WAN are called differently for very good reasons. Basically, when you extend the distance of the links, uh, local area network um, protocols and the technology don't really work very well. So the, the, the maintainability and reliability of this kind of solution was basically uh, um, hampered by the very long distances. That's why the second version of the LHC1, which is the one we have now, was based on uh, VRF, so uh, virtual routing and forwarding uh, um, technology. So basically, uh, it was a distributed multi-domain uh, layer three VPN. And this was the very first uh, uh, implementation. Uh, then it um, grew over time. So this was another version from a few years later. And this is what it looks like now. So uh, you don't, don't look at the, you know, don't, don't, don't even try to look at the detail. I just wanted to give you the 
uh, you know, the, the scale about this uh, service has now uh, grown to basically cover mostly all over the world. It, it's, it's present in almost every country, uh, sorry, every continent except, the, you know, Antarctica, as far as we know. Um, in Asia Pacific, this was actually the first, uh, the first implementation was uh, from 2011. And even there, now it's grown into a much, much larger infrastructure. Uh, now, this, you can see, was uh, one of the first uh, um, uh, data analysis that we did. This was the only on the GIA network. Uh, and I think it was uh, uh, in uh, 2010, 12, sorry, 2012. Uh, and you can see there were peaks around 12 gigabit. And this was last week, where peaks only on the Jean backbone in excess of 600 gigabit. And we have seen that in the data challenge a few months back, reaching peaks of one uh, terabit on the Jean backbone for only LH1 traffic. Now, the experiment that was supported um, by this infrastructure were originally the one supported by the worldwide LHC computing grid. So uh, the, big, the four big um, CERN e um, experiment. But then over time, other experiments have been added, have been made eligible to use the infrastructure, like the Bell 2 experiment, and uh, in um, further on the Pierre Auger Observatory, uh, the NOVA experiment, the Xenon 1 experiment, and very recently the Juno experiment. Uh, so the reason for this, um, uh, you know, for allowing more experiments was basically to make the life simple for especially big sites, because or multiple scientific organizations. So now the problem is if you have two sites that support multiple experiments and they move data between themselves, they would have been uh, forced to basically split their traffic. So from the site A to B that are both on LHC1, if they want to move data for uh, Atlas, let's say that was allowed, but if they have to move data related to other experiment, in theory, they were not allowed to use LHC1. And that would have made their life very complicated in terms of their own routing. Was why the reason why more experiment were added because if you have to move data from A to B and both sides and let you want, it doesn't really make sense to you know do this sort of a fine grain uh, selection of what data can go and what data cannot. So this was a good idea, as I say, to make life easier for uh, site administrators. Uh, these are now the NRENs and the read network. Uh, and the providers around the world that support LHC1. As, as you can see, they are basically everywhere. I, I, I try to more or less give a resemblance of geographic distribution. Um, um, and uh, uh, as I've said, you can see from, from you know, East, West, North and South America, all around Europe uh, and uh, um, the Asia Pacific, it's, there is plenty of network that now support LHC1. The, um, the infrastructure doesn't only come with the um, configurations and and uh, an actual infrastructure. It also comes with one some very important assets. Let's say that make that they kind of enrich the platform in itself. Uh, there is a wiki that you know explains all the ins and outs and the, the the detail of the implementation and so on. There are network operators guides, how to and best practices. Um, there is a, a BGP um, filtering um, facility that allows a very fine control of the traffic for the ISP and also the sites. So basically it's, it's based on BGP communities and they can have a very fine grain um, uh, selection of sites they want to connect or they want to advertise. Not so it, it's very powerful. There is now a host all the... Uh, uh, as I said, there are also site connection guidelines. And very important, there is a personal monitoring infrastructure that is extremely pervasive. So basically, every site that is part of LHC1 has a personal node installed. So this makes for the troubleshooting a very, very powerful um, uh, platform. Uh, one of the things that uh, is, um, as I said, is important is the flexibility of this solution. You can see that there are. We can go all the way from a site that has a uh, uh, multiple routers, 
connected to a RENREN that allows for uh, um, the um, deployment of a dedicated VRF, we can go all the way to sites that have one single router connected to an internet that doesn't provide that facility, but that can provide transit to the next NREN in line that can provide the uh, VRF support. So basically, okay, so I mean, just to, just to conclude. Um, so I was saying the, the, the good thing is about the flexibility. So it allows a flexible uh, access to the infrastructure, both to the sites and to the NREN. Um, of course, you know, if you have a, a simpler configuration, uh, in terms of infrastructure, so like a single router, it requires a bit more complicated configuration on the side because you have to do, for example, source-based routing. But um, but it's uh, it it's manageable. Uh, so to conclude, LH1 provides a number of advantages. Um, so as I've said, um, some of these are related to the very nature of it. Like for example, it has a very short routing table if you compare to the global routing table, even of the RNA networks, which means you have a, a you know in, you have an easier time doing troubleshooting because you have less site. It also creates a trusted environment, which is the main advantage of this infrastructure. Like for example, it allows you to create or deploy a science DMZ without um, any additional effort because if you have two routers, one connected to LHC1 and one connected to the general IP. The one connected to LHC1 can have um, a relaxed set of security enforcement. Like for, for example, you don't need a firewall. You can do basic uh, ACL-based security, uh, which means that you uh, protect your data flow, your large data flows from the firewall that usually is the one that kills long distance, uh, high uh, performance data transfer. Um, on the other end, you have a reliable, a reliable infrastructure because, as I've said, you have a, a pervasive per persona monitoring infrastructure. Uh, there are well-identified peering points, which means you have also routing stability, which is quite important because you minimize the problems related to um, uh, um, routing asymmetries. And uh, um, as I've said, you have a very fine control in terms of the um, connection and the uh, advertisement that happened on LH1 by the BGP community uh, um, uh, um, facility, which basically it means that you end up with uh, an environment that gives you very high performance data transfer, but also a simplified troubleshooting, which basically give you also the opportunity of uh, sorting out problems quite more efficiently and quickly than on the general IP. And uh, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we were discussing about the Q&A at, at the break time. And uh, uh, the Professor Luz P Nur Pisa, are you there? Professor Pisa? Yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready to start? Uh, okay, so I'm going to share the screen. Yes. Uh, sorry for that. I can give you 10 minutes. Please, whenever you are ready, and go ahead. Okay. And to give the permit is Nuru Pisa, my Isa, Mat Isa. Okay, so I can. Uh, sorry, I want to find out this one. Okay. Okay, we can see you. All right. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. And she is uh, the professor of the uh, related to bioinformatics areas. So he his presentation is aviation infection diseases in uh, the professor in the UPM from Valencia. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to present on. Um, uh, I'm going to share. Okay, the presentation actually uh, based on uh, what I'm doing and then what is related to the HPC and also the uh, uh, big data. Okay, so basically uh, my pre presentation title is uh, Poultry Future Data Driven in the Fight Against Avian Infectious uh, Diseases. So I'm covering the uh, uh, sum of information on the poultry industry. Uh, the diseases that we concern and then the prevention and control of the disease 
and how the data driven bioethics could transform uh, post health monit uh, monitoring in terms of the HPC application and uh, some of the research highlight and development, uh, which is I think uh, more more or less is related to uh, uh, Dr. Asif presentation before the focusing on virus, but the difference is I'm focusing more on the uh, poultry viruses. Okay, and then how from, from from that information that we can have, uh, we can leverage the vaccine technology advancement, pay forward, and how extreme the HPC is required. So basically, um, livestock is the second highest uh, contributor to the value of gross output for domination agriculture se sector, which is contribute about eighteen point seven billion, where the poultry itself is contribute around uh sixteen point eight billion. And Malaysia is self-sufficient for poultry meat and eggs, where Malaysia is uh, consumption is among the higher in the world. Okay, so the rapid growing of poultry industry, however, not free from many issues and challenges such as high production costs and also imaging and re-imaging diseases. So to date, almost all non-major poultry diseases has been reported in Malaysia. Uh, so the most important thing is to prevent and control the poultry disease. Uh, involve a uh, complex understanding of the interaction between the agent, host, and environment. And this uh, can usually be achieved by the proper biosecurity, vaccination, and flock health management uh, programs. So uh, it's difficult and expensive to always maintain a high, high level of biosecurity. And those poultry vaccine and health management programs are powerful tool in disease uh, prevention and control. So this is the common disease that... Uh, uh, affect uh, the poultry industry. Uh, you can see here that from the bacteria, fungus, uh, virus, um, but our research here is more concerned on the virus infection. Okay? So basically, uh, there are three important factors that uh, involve in the prevention and control of the disease. The first, of course, there are environmental factors which include the proper biosecurity, uh, good farm management practice. Okay? And then uh, second is the host uh, or chicken itself. Uh, which is we need to implement the effective uh, vaccination and monitoring program and also, again, good farm management practice. And then the third one is the agent factors, uh, which uh, we need to uh, diagnose uh, the disease accurately uh, where we detect or we isolate uh, the agent and then we do the catheterization. Uh, so in order for to do that, so we need to do the effective uh, routine virus surveillance and monitoring program, and also um, uh, some farm also they do some effective treatment treatment uh, with uh, the use of uh, prudent use of the antibiotics or drugs. So basically, the whole process of, for accurate diagnosis is based on the conventional like history, clinical science. Uh, and also the detection and isolation of the uh, virus or pathogen itself. And then, um, but uh, later we move to the laboratory technique, which is uh, more accurate and then um, uh, uh, what we call more fast. Okay, so we focus more on the uh, sequencing. Okay, so um, like um, Dr. As mentioned before, so from the sequence itself, we can tell many more uh, information uh, regarding to the health of uh, the chicken uh, itself also. Okay, so basically this is uh, uh, the, the ecosystem in our uh, laboratory where we have the lab that we carry the, the wet lab, I mean uh, wet work, which is uh, including, the, includes the uh, vaccine design and development and also the disease uh, diagnostic, so diagnosis. So from that, uh, uh, we also do the sequencing here, and then from that data, so we, we move uh, to the next uh, lab. Uh, we focus on the dry uh, analysis, uh, which is here we can go for the uh, genomic selection for post breeding, uh, and then we can do for uh, more information about the uh, disease um, surveillance and also uh, the vaccine uh, um, uh, design and development program. And then we also have the, uh, the facility for area research and session where this one we reproduce uh, the disease that happened uh, in the outbreak and then also we study about the vaccine potency and also the vaccine efficacy study. So um, 
how actually the bioinformatics could transform a poultry health monitoring uh, where we applied HPC here. So traditionally, bioinformatics is the science of uh, store, retrieve, and analyze the large amount of biological information to solve a certain biological or biomedical problem. And this bioinformatics is normally um, uh, include or involve a uh, different type of uh, specialists or expert uh, um, not limited to biologists, but we include on the um, uh, mathematics computer science, right? So bioinformatics combine both uh, computational and statistical approach in order to analyze biological data such as uh, genome uh, sequencing. So basically, this is the current uh, model the approach uh, uh, that uh, what we call um the broadened perspective of the bioinformatics, which is from the data is uh, it can. Uh, analyze not only for gene uh, omics, uh, genomics or only for domics. Okay, so basically it can cross among uh, this uh, uh, information okay, to solve uh, some of the problem. Okay. So basically, um, uh, so this is how actually we relate uh, the uh, HPC bioinformatics and also the traditional instrument research. So the ability of sequences in archive database, where for example, like the, the uh, database in NCBI, uh, as we mentioned before, and then some uh, some of the market price for sequencing uh, of the sample has become affordable, and then the sequencing machine become more accessible, so means a lot of data has been produced. Okay, so uh, this is where we need the HPC to, to collect all the uh, data sample, all the information of the sequencing. And then from that, we need to translate into more powerful information or powerful knowledge, right? Uh, and of course, uh, in the shortest time. So, um, so this is some specific requirement to perform. Of course, we need the high quality of sample and then we need the machine itself and also the adequate computation structure and uh, structure and infrastructure and bioinformatic tools to analyze large volume of sequencing data are generated. So this is some of the work that we have done uh, with bioinformatics. So we, we do the whole genome uh, sequencing, uh, sequencing, sorry. Uh, for the uh, viruses that isolate from the uh, uh, what we call broiler chicken, okay, and then um, so uh, this um sequence data also is a uh, uh, what, uh, what we call that a great promise to help monitor, identify, and track uh, poultry flock health. So, normally used to detect early infection, they may affect the productivity of the flock. So the data analysis allow for quick implementation of corrective management uh, process and the nucleic acid of the disease agent that are present in sample are decoded. Okay, so some uh so basically from uh the data that uh get from the bioinformatics is extensive extensively used uh in worldwide, for example in China, they also use uh from some uh, some, uh data. Uh, from bioinformatics data actually to to uh to implement in their poultry health management uh, system, okay. And of uh and of course uh for this uh sequencing uh information, so they actually is important in decoding the gene, so where we can uh, know about the pathogen pass, uh how long the pathogen yeah. persists, uh in certain uh consist uh certain cases. Okay, infection, for example, and then can replace the contact vaccine and then investigate the mutation. And also all this information will point the way to vaccines, antibiotics, diagnostic kit, monitoring program, and public health uh, strategies. So besides the whole genome sequencing, we also do uh, the uh, RNA sequencing. So basically, uh, as mentioned by Yim and Chisholm in 2017, the distributed computing environment allow functional annotation process of large transcript data to produce comprehensive information of the large uh, transcript data. Right. So this is some of the example that we use uh, RNA sequencing and then uh, data that we have from the estimated try uh, when we infect uh, different uh, line, different chicken line with the uh, infectious with the disease or virus. Okay, and then uh, from that we also do some of metagenomic profile observing any evidence of the antimicrobial resistant gene released from the poultry farm to the community. So basically, this one is related more related on the bacteria uh, community. Uh, in the farm. So, uh, uh, and then um, beside that, some of our work also we do on the 
uh, assess the impact on the efficiency of the water waste management, wastewater treatment. Okay, so this one is regarding more on the alpha diversity microbial community profile. Okay, and then um, we also perform the network of nodes and age of ARG, ARG, ARG to species and also the species uh, species. Okay, uh, so all those information we use to leverage the vaccine technology advancement. So we will study the bioinformatics of pathogen genome and then profile host pathogen interaction, uh, pathogen genome editing, and also a combination of the reverse uh, genetic uh, technology. So we can see that uh, the what we call the, the, the technology in terms of the vaccine development are changed from the conventional to the next generation vaccine. So this is a, uh, this is what we want to thank uh, for the bioinformatics because from that, uh, information that we manage to design the vaccine that's suitable uh, to the pathogen uh, that is uh, in fact uh, to the pathway. So this is uh, one of the my, uh, what we call um, research or finding where we use the, uh, where we study the pathogen uh, the, uh, of the chicken. Uh, uh, here we use the full adenovirus and then uh, we study about the sequence and then from that we able to design uh, uh, innovative uh, vaccine using the CRISPR Cas9 uh, technology, where we shorten uh, the time uh, to what we call, um, uh, uh, to get uh, the sick uh, 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 and stable uh, uh, candidate vaccine instead use the uh, normal attenuation process, which can uh, which need more longer time uh, to produce uh, the candidate vaccine. So way forward, it is important to detect any genetic diversity and changes in genetic materials of the viral and the protein, as well as their host in response to, the, to solve the protein infection outbreak issue. So bioinformatics provide a great promise in monitoring, tracking, identifying, and protecting our country, commercialized uh, poultry industry, and the, and the, uh, the exponential growth of HPC technology will enhance the genomic surveillance protocol and enable researchers around the globe to combat against the avian infection diseases holistically and efficiently. So how extreme HPC is required so basically it depends on the data and choice of the tool. And if you mention to the downstream analysis, of course, uh, uh, depends on type of the analysis, is that de novo assembly, so we need the denial of the server and then uh, for parallel amount of data and application, so we need to uh, uh, what we call depends on the platform chosen either four five five or my six. Okay, and then the objective of the uh, study itself either we want to focus on whole genome or transcript yeah. assembly, and then uh, it would it would need uh, multiple core CPU, better GPU, and huge RAM. So um, if that available reference or genome or we call the direct mapping, so maybe less RAM can work, okay, and CPU system core for small classes. And then um, some uh, study, we need the GPU, which is focused on visualization and protein uh, modeling. We include the graphic part. So uh, utilize GPU power for processing and computation, for example, like molecular dynamic solution, a uh, simulation. Uh, MDS is, has seen huge acceleration speed up due to GPU-based code. Okay, uh, and then for example, Ember, Chromex. Okay, so all these major MD simulations have released their GPU based parallel version for speedy uh, simulation. So, apart from this, many uh, other algorithms have also uh, been made parallel using uh, GPU like multiple sequence alignment, NG analysis software, population biology software. So, with conventional application uh, for past. Um, uh, fast graphic processing and also with a standard cavity as parallel processor, GPU card have been really helpful for uh, bioinformatics. So of course, uh, there is uh, there are limitation and strength of HPC bioinformatics relationship. So the strength is of course the time to workload ratio of T and cost effective and also time saving in producing comprehensive amount of data. But the limitation, because we are life sciences uh, experts, so we require an uh, IT background personnel to assist in managing the HPC environment. And also we uh, require proper HPC facility, hence open for collaboration 
uh, and use as a case study for HDC performance because uh, the the I mean uh, the we thinking about the to collaborate with the poultry uh, industry farmers uh, or SME um, uh, communities okay, to actually to to provide a solution in terms of the surveillance uh, program where I think uh, the collect uh, we need the real time data collection and uh, also the the from that data that we can uh, go for HPC for the large uh, data analysis okay, to 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 open uh, the opportunity to what we call to find out the biomarker uh, to detect or to predict uh, the disease uh, in future in the poultry farm. Okay, so I think uh, with that, uh, thank you. Thank you, the Professor Fija. And uh, the next turn is the Susumu Date from the Osaka University in Japan. Uh, he gonna share the experience of DTN and our the session one, the last presenter. Yeah, it's yours. Yeah, it works well. You think you can take the minutes. Okay, okay. As we went. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Susan Tate uh, with Cyber Media Center. So today I'd like to, uh, to talk about just update of the uh, last presentation uh, in uh, Apan, Nepal. So the so this is a uh, so I'm from the Cyber Media Center, uh, Osaka University. Basically, we uh, Cyber Media Center is a supercomputing center at Osaka University. So, so we have provide we are now providing the uh, two supercomputer systems, Octopus and Squid. So, and uh, importantly, the, actually, the, uh, the we are providing the, these computing services to the Japanese researcher, but uh, uh, but. International research researchers like you can also uh, use our supercomputing system using the framework of JHPCN. So JHPCN is, is actually the uh, the collaboration uh, among the uh, supercomputing center in Japan, and uh, we are pro providing the CPU, GPU, and many uh, different type of resources. And if we can set up the uh, international collaboration with us, so you can use the supercomputing resources. So that is this is very important and things, and. Uh, uh, last, last in uh, last, last, last uh, Pam, So I uh, explained uh, uh, my plan uh, uh, about uh, 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 the DTN solutions uh, on uh, uh, data infrastructure in Osaka University. So, so let me explain what is Onion and what is uh, uh, why DTN is required. So again, so actually the uh, in. Uh, in 2021, so we have uh, a deployed supercomputing system named Squid. So Squid is basically the supercomputer for Quest to the Unsolved Interdisciplinary Data Science. This is an uh, acronym, the name of the supercomputing system. And uh, through the uh, the provide so through the provision of this supercomputer system, we are aiming to the enhance the use of the AI. Uh, 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 enhance the use of the supercomputing system by AI people. But now uh, we don't, we are not worried about the uh, use of AI, a supercomputing system by AI people because AI people are already using the, uh, the supercomputer system. So because actually we have providing the uh, uh, A100 uh, GPU uh, resources. Anyway, so, and the so important point, so that now uh, supercomputing center is focusing on the, uh, the provision of supercomputing resources to the uh, HPC people. But, but the AI people always complain to me, okay? HPC people always think about the computing resources, computing resources, okay? But the AI people think about the data. So what, where data is located is very really important. So that's why so we, uh, uh, and we designed uh, the data infrastructure, so named Onion. So Onion is a, uh, so the, the Onion is a, a data aggregation infrastructure. So Onion is short for 
Osaka University Next Generation Infrastructure for Open Research and Open Innovation. So the, actually we uh, use a, a, a small portion of the uh, our procurement budget of supercomputer system uh, to deploy this data uh, aggregation infrastructure. Uh, thanks to the uh, no, Onion, so now uh, people, uh, uh, the researchers in Osaka University en are enjoying their, uh, the, the uh, and uh, people, uh, researchers in Osaka University can easily move the data from the uh, the uh, their department and their own department or research institution to our cyber media center supercomputing system. So, so before the su uh, squid supercomputer system, that the uh, AI people always complain. Okay, so data. Uh, uh, a supercomputer system just provides so the uh, the data transfer system like uh, scopy or uh, other very command line very simple uh, uh, the you know, uh, way of data transfer but now so the cam campus user can move the data uh, from the IOT device to supercomputer system easily and also the uh, user can move the data from the uh, scientific devices uh, like telescope to the supercomputer system. That means actually we can uh, increase the utilization of supercomputer system because the data is located in supercomputer system. That is our strategy. And the, and the, and the, the structure, uh, no, 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 it, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> And, uh, in, actually, the uh, onion structure is very simple. Actually, the combination of the three different storage solutions. So one is uh, a next cloud, one is a uh, exascaler, so parallel file system, raster file system, and one is uh, object storage. So parallel file system provides a high high performance I/O. So read write uh, I/O performance is very good, and the object storage provides uh, uh, the, the secure uh, the. Uh, management of the data and uh, next cloud provides an uh, intuitive uh, uh, web interface and uh, uh, through the synergy of these three uh, three solutions now uh, the supercomputer users uh, uh, enjoy the uh, data movement on to the supercomputer system and but one of the problem was there and actually the, uh, the now people can uh, obtain the way of the moving the data uh, but the performance was always an issue. So now our the users always say, oh, okay, the performance. Uh, so Onium allows us to move the data easy, but uh, the performance is issue. So that's why actually in last pro uh, uh, APAM, so we just showed that this plan. So now it, Cyber Super Computer Center is located in Cyber Media Center and uh, so in, in the campus, there are many depart, uh, department and research in, uh, institutions that produces a lot of data. And that's why, so we are now planning to connect the data, uh, connect the established uh, the 100 gigabit network to the each research uh, infrastructure, uh, research institution and department. And the only, and on both, on both sides of the cyber media center and research uh, institution, uh, we are now trying to deploy the DTN, data transfer node, so that the researcher can move data uh, very quickly. So this is a plan, and uh, but this is just plan, but not yet. And uh, so this uh, from this slide, so I'd like to uh, just show the uh, progress and update for the last event. Okay, so now we are designing the uh, red and uh, uh, red onion uh, from actual operation perspective. So red onion means uh, uh, research enhanced onion. Okay, so onion is just for the, I <laughs> know, uh, uh, anyway. So red, red onion is a research enhanced uh, and onion. So this is a uh, still uh, designing. So maybe the, uh, we change the uh, design. So anyway, super computer. Uh, is, uh, is here at uh, the right side and left side is uh, uh, research de uh, department or the infra research institution. And in each side, so DTN are uh, 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 DTN servers are, are deployed. And, uh, on, and uh, in addition to the DTN server, we are now planning to uh, deploy the uh, SSD based uh, uh, the, uh, storage, so stage for staging and uh, aggregation storage. So, and uh, 
we the actually basic uh, principle of the design is simple is the best. We, that's why we just provide. Uh, we are planning to just provide the high speed data transfer services uh, on the on the red red onion uh, the infrastructure. So if we, uh, no, our design is uh, yeah, completed. So the I think uh, the uh, no, user can just choose the uh, destination of the data transfer from the data sources, and so maybe the infrastructure uh, no uh, interface is very simple one, uh, and if the uh, data in the case that the user transfer the data from the department A, uh, department A to the department B. Maybe the medical school to the uh, research department of the life science, and uh, in the case actually all traffic going through the uh, cyber media center, and, uh, and on the way to the data transfer, so data is uh, stored in the, our supercomputing centers, object storage, and object storage can co be connected to the parallel file system. So that's why the data is always located on the our supercomputer system. So after that, so the, our HPC user and AI user can enjoy the high performance of the computational resources provided by the, our supercomputer system. That is plan. And uh, and uh, so and but uh, so you know that so in, in many scientific users just think that well high speed network, so I mean the physical network is enough. So because if we set up the one, uh, one, uh, 100 gigabit network, so science people believe that 100 gigabit throughput can be obtained, but that is not true. So that's why actually we have to check that, uh, the uh, performance of the DTN. So I mean, the uh, whether, uh, whether the uh, DTN can actually gain the performance. So that's why I'm uh, now trying to test the several uh, DTN technology. Uh, sorry, my time is over. <laughs> so now actually the, this is a candidate and uh, and now we are testing the uh, local, uh, we are now trying to the, uh, investigate the performance profile of the several uh, DTN from the actual perspective. So actually the, uh, we know that uh, DTN as a service is a very good technology, but uh, and uh, unfortunately they uh, don't have the, any uh, good technical staff enough to the uh, operate that uh, the open source based software. So that's why the, uh, we have to uh, know, get the help from the uh, Japanese company. So we are not thinking about the which one is a very good uh, uh, in uh, daily use of the DTM. And uh, so this is a uh, uh, so and. Uh, so now, still actually, we are testing the uh, our data solutions uh, in local area network. But we are going, to, uh, we are uh, now planning to have the same demonstration. Uh, so, uh, no, the demonstration of supercomputing using the uh, network between Japan and uh, United States. This is actually the uh, no, abstract of uh, actually I submitted. And maybe if you uh, know, this is a uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, the slide of showing the uh, slide of showing the supercomputing 19. So actually, we in the case in, at the time we used the 10G network, but uh, in the case of supercomputing 2023, so we are planning to use 100 gigabit network from the Japan to the United States. So I hopefully actually. I know we are uh, know, getting the same result, a uh, good result in supercomputing 2020, uh, 2023. So if you see in 19, actually we gained the good performance of using the, uh, in the case of using the, uh, the 10G network use. Hopefully we get uh, one very good result. Sorry, actually that, that time is running out and already over. So, so summary, this is the uh, no, 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 my upgrade. So now I'm still, we are still designing the, uh, the red onion and, uh, and for the purpose of the uh, no, performance evaluation. So we are going to uh, do the, uh, the uh, red onion demonstration in supercomputing. That's all, thank you so much.